right. Now we recorded. All right. Sorry, folks at home. You don't get to hear us singing. All right. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord and Savior Jesus, you are unsearchable, unseeable until you show us yourself. And you showed us yourself in the best way through Jesus. But in the meantime, you showed yourself in very unique and special ways throughout the Old Testament. And especially, Lord, as we begin the study of Ezekiel, what a bizarre kind of way that you showed yourself to Ezekiel. But Lord, help us to see the many objects and the many uh, meanings that there are throughout this vision that you give to Ezekiel to bring comfort to stubborn people, to bring truth to people that did not want to listen to the truth, to speak a word to them as you speak a word to our world today. Be with us, bless us, and help us as you always do as we read and study your word. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. All right, so before I show you this, we're going we're gonna to watch a video. But before we do that, if I ask you, what do you think of when I say the story, when I say Genesis? Creation, all right? What else do you think of when I say Genesis? Bible stories. What Bible stories? Creation? Genesis, Adam and Eve, what else? Cain and Abel, what else? The flood, what else? Lots of them, right? Abraham, I heard Abraham, good. All right, Joseph, all right, good. How about Exodus? When you think of Exodus, what stories do you think? Joseph, Egypt, Red Sea, lots of things, all right? When I say Daniel, what stories do you think of? Daniel the lion's den. That's the first one, isn't it? And what's the other one? Yeah, the three men, the fiery furnace, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? When I say Ezekiel, what stories do you think of? Dry bones. Okay, I heard that. Ezekiel 37, dry bones. The wheels, all right? You think about the wheels, all right? Good, good. What was fun is last night when I asked them that, they all went, uh. I said, yeah, that's pretty true, isn't it? You know, we're familiar with a lot of these stories, but did you learn in Sunday school about the wheels? Did you learn in Sunday school about the dry bones? Maybe, maybe not. All right, maybe, maybe not, but the dry bones, all right? And as far as our scripture readings, what we read in scripture and as we go through Sunday services and so on, you know, we'll get to dry bones, all right? That's a Pentecost, um, one of the three-year Pentecost series and so on. So we'll get that. But otherwise, you know, Ezekiel is kind of an unknown book, isn't it? Kind of an unknown book. All right, so let's get time frame in here. So we begin at creation, and so we have Adam and Eve, and then the next big one is Noah and the flood, right? I mean, let's let's go kind of kind of big jumps. All right, so we got Adam and Eve. We got Noah and the flood. After Noah, then we have Father Abraham, right? Okay, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on. All right. Then after Abraham. Then we've got the children of Israel, right? And we've got then uh, Israel and the 12 tribes. And then they they're in Egypt and so on. And then we get into after Abraham and we get all the 12 tribes of Israel. Where do they end up? Egypt, right? 400 years, right? And then God calls Moses, all right? So we got Abraham and we got them, all right, in, in Egypt. And then we got Moses. And we got all the stories about Moses, right? And all the different things, Mount Sinai and the 40 years of wilderness and so on. After Moses, then we have who's after Moses? Who's the leader? Joshua. And we got the whole story of Joshua and the settling of the tribes and all of them getting in their promised land and all of that, right? After Joshua dies, who's the next one? You're right, there isn't. Because who follows Joshua? All of the judges. So we have all these years of the judges, and we've got, oh, the people of Israel just really going way bad on that, all right? So we got all the judges until finally we have the final judge, who was Samuel. And when Samuel comes, what do the people want? A king! I want a king! So now we've got kings, and we got all the kings that we got going on here, right? And we've got the kings, and we've got the split, and we've got the northern ten tribes of of Israel, and we got the southern Judah that's there, right? And then we got the 10 northern tribes being taken into the Assyrian captivity, right? 
And then we have the, the Judah taken into the Babylonian captivity. Now we have Ezekiel. So I wanted to take you through that so that you got that timeline that's in there. There's a lot that has happened. There's a lot of biblical history, a lot of God showing himself to his people throughout all these centuries, literally millennia, of God with his people prior to Ezekiel. And the only way we're going to really hear and understand Ezekiel is kind of remembering some of those. So we'll be coming back to those. All right. Very frequently as we look at Ezekiel and a lot of the symbols and a lot of the images and, and a lot of the different things that are there. All right. Let me show you an overview, first of all, of, of Ezekiel. If you notice and you can't. Well, no, you can't see it up here because it's, it's not showing that way. But it's Ezekiel part one of two. Ezekiel is so long that we have two of these, which is kind of nice. The first part is going to be kind of what we'll start off spending our time on. And then in chapter 34, it'll be a little while before we get there, but chapter 34, there's a major change in Ezekiel. And we'll have the second video then with starting with chapter 34. But for right now, let me show you this one. And let's just give you a heads up. The book on... of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack. And they barracked the city, but they took first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile. And Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that. Oops, sorry. Well, Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has a vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting the stabbling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature, glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God of the chariot. Now, the word glory, in Hebrew, it's kavod. It means heavy or significant. The biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and manifestation of God's significance when he shows up in person. These images in the vision, they're very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. And it's also very similar to the depictions of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel's vision. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant, in the temple, in Jerusalem. And so the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel of rebellion. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot, and he commissions him as a prophet. Ezekiel is to accuse Israel of breaking their covenant agreement with God in a couple ways. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols, and this has all led to rampant social injustice, violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another. And Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. And these were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. So he was supposed to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. Or he was to shave off all of his hair and then chop it up with a sword. Or the most extreme, he was to play the role of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And he would lay on his side for over a year, eating food cooked over food as a sign of the nasty food that people will have to eat during the siege of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And this recalls Moses' description of the people after the wilderness rebellion. 
when he predicted that exile would one day happen. And Ezekiel had the unfortunate privilege of seeing it all come to pass. And so a dismayed Ezekiel, he begins to perform his task. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple, and he sees what's happening there in his absence, and it is not good. In the outer courtyard, in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz. And the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, oh. going east, headed towards Babylon. And so in chapter 11, we come to see why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there. Israel's idolatry and their covenant violations have become so blatant and offensive that God has left his temple. They've driven him away and he consigns it to destruction. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land, and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. This is a small glimmer of hope, and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the imminent destruction. But chapter 11 is the key transition, and it helps us understand how the rest of the book has been designed. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. But then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First, hope for Israel, then for the nations, then for all creation. Chapters 12 to 24 focus on God's judgment on Israel. And this is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And here Ezekiel shows his fondness for parable and allegory. So he depicts Israel as a burnt, useless stick, or as a rebellious wife, or as a dangerous, raging lion that gets captured, or as two promiscuous sisters. These are all depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and idolatry that results in their ruin. In this section, Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer. He begins arguing the case that, first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation. And that even if the most righteous people in the world, like Noah or Daniel or Job, were alive and praying for God to spare Israel, God would not accept their prayers. It's far too late. And so God's goodness actually demands that he bring justice on this generation of Israel. The exile has become inevitable. They've reached the point of no return. Following this, Ezekiel focuses first on the nations immediately around Israel, and then on the two most powerful states in the region, Egypt and then Tyre. Israel has allied with these nations and adopted their gods and their idols. And so God accuses the kings of Tyre and Egypt for arrogantly viewing themselves as gods who get to define right and wrong on their own terms. And God holds these kings accountable for their pride, and he announces that he will use Babylon to bring them down. They will face God's justice along with everybody else. Following these really intense sections is a short story in chapter 33. Ezekiel's met by a refugee who's just arrived from Jerusalem, and he gives them the report that Babylon has attacked the city of Jerusalem, that the city has fallen, and the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim warnings have become a reality. But remember, the end of chapter 11, that's not the end of the story. And so in the next video, we'll explore Ezekiel's profound vision of hope. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Ezekiel. All right, so for now, that's the first half. All right, good. Let's talk a little bit more about, whoops. Well, let's see if we can, here we go. Okay. So this, that was a quick, kind of overview for that. Oh, good. You have on your sheet, you have actually four pages today. You have one page next time. Um, I'm, I've just decided I'm not going to kill so many trees by printing so much stuff off for you and just give you some kind of um, some, some major questions after this. But I wanted to, to give that to you first of all. So that first introduction, what's going on here? Somebody read that for us, would you? 
Begin your class by reading. Do you see it there? Begin your class by reading Pauli material aloud. It was July 593 BC, a little over four years earlier, April 597, Nebuchadnezzar had carried off the upper strata of the chosen people of the Babylonian. Second Kings 24, 10 through 16. Here some of them settled at Tel Aviv on the Kabar River. How's that the name? Yes. Okay. A canal of Euphrates River to the exile of the world seemed out of joint. The heavens no longer would declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, 1. Instead, they seemed to proclaim his defeat. His loss of control appeared complete, and a few years later, the holy city and his temple were leveled, 2 Kings 25, 8 through 12. All the stars of hope and salvation promised to all nations through the offspring of Abraham were eclipsed by the glaring brilliance of the brutal forces of evil. I'll stop here just a minute, Steve, all right? So so look up here at the at the picture, whichever, at the, at the map, and it's a little bit fuzzy and so on. But all right, here's Jerusalem, all right? And here's Judah. And so what we have is the Babylonian captivity. There were two times that uh, the uh, Babylonians came. So they come over a thousand miles, 1500 miles. All right. I, you can't see it. Uh, no, I didn't put it. It's on the next one, but it's like 1500 miles. So they came from Babylon. They came and, and took them captive and they took Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, Ezekiel. All right. And others. That was the first time. The second time that they come back over, they destroy the temple and they completely take everybody except for Jeremiah, who stays there, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, how fascinating Jeremiah and Ezekiel are contemporaries. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, Ezekiel is in Babylon, yes, and God's word, the same word, is being spoken to both of them, and Jeremiah is speaking to those who stayed in Jerusalem, and Ezekiel is speaking to those who were taken into captivity, all right? And so that's kind of what, what we're getting here, all right? And so as the people are left from Jerusalem, where did God say his throne was? Where did God place his throne? Where did he say, I will meet with, with my people and talk with them? Where in Jerusalem? In a temple, where in a temple? And the Holy of Holies, what was in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. And where in the Ark of the Covenant was God's throne? Well, I'm glad I asked. What was on top of the Ark of the Covenant? The cherubim. The cherubim. What was the mercy seat? Yes, the mercy seat. God's throne. And we'll look at some, some passages here that talk about that. That God's physical presence as if the God of all creation can have a physical presence. But he had been telling them since the, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, we could have started back at Mount Sinai when the Ark of the Covenant uh, was made and the cherubim were there in the mercy seat and so on. And God's throne where he sat, where he talked to his people was on that mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim. I'm getting you ready for the vision that Ezekiel is going to have, okay, between the cherubim. Now, if these um, Israelites are all taken to Babylon, where's God? He's still back in Jerusalem. Well, you know better. But what are they thinking? They're thinking, oh no, God is still back in Jerusalem because that's where the ark is. When the Babylonians come the second time and destroy Jerusalem and take the ark and destroy the ark, Quit looking for it. You're not going to find it. All right. But what what are they thinking? Oh, no. God is gone. Not with us. He's, he's nowhere there. So where's his throne? You get it? So Ezekiel's vision is going to be extremely important for his people to say, is God still on his throne? Well, of course he is. How do we know it is? Well, because God gave Ezekiel a special vision that's there, all right? So thanks, Steve. We, we, we kind of get that, that little bit of history of what's going on here. And I mean, this is, this is bad news. You know, Babylon is, is, is the bad news. We don't want to have them over in Babylon.
So let's just do this real quickly. And, and I mentioned it to you, but just a reminder to you. All right. So Jeremiah, prophet in Jerusalem, he had a 40 year ministry. Ezekiel's was only 22 years. All right. But uh, his his ministry that was there. And so Jeremiah was 29 years before the fall of Jerusalem. Ezekiel was just seven years, of course, because he was taken into captivity in Babylon. And then it was seven years that he comes back and, and they destroy Jerusalem. All right. Don't worry about that. But here we have it. And then um, Jeremiah then is to those in Jerusalem. Ezekiel is to those in Babylon. And just uh, for uh, trivia's sake, Jeremiah and Ezekiel had 11 years that they prophesied uh, together that way. All right. So let's have somebody read for us Ezekiel chapter one. Please. The whole chapter? The whole chapter. <laughs> now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin. That's good. Captivity. By the way, he was the last king of Israel, if you remember, Jehoiachin. Was the last king of Israel? Go ahead. The word of the Lord came expressly uh, to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the children, Chaldeans, by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Stop there just a second. I knew you, you knew I was going to stop you. Two things I want you to notice the word of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. Can you keep that in mind as we're reading Ezekiel? Okay. The word of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. Hey, go ahead. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within, within it came the likeness of four living creatures. The likeness, keep that in mind, go ahead. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a, of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward, two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies, and each one were, went straight forward. They went wherever the spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flashing, a flashing lightning. Somebody else take it. Okay, hey, verse 15, pick it up, somebody. As I looked at the living creature, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them. Because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. 
When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheel. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out one toward the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of wash, rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads, and they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. And I heard the voice of one speaking. Okay, the likeness of the glory of the Lord. All right. Now read chapter 10. Go to Ezekiel chapter 10 and let's read Ezekiel chapter 10. Glory departs from the temple. I looked and I saw the likeness of a throne of a sapphire above the expanse. That was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, Go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And I watched, and as I watched, he went in. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple, and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as far away as the outer court, like the voice of, the Almighty, of God Almighty when he speaks. I pause just a second. I'll have to continue just a minute. Where is this happening in chapter 10? In the temple. Where was chapter one? In Babylon. All right, I wanted you to, to notice that, okay? And so, you know, here we have, so Ezekiel has been picked up by the hair and carried by the spirit back to Jerusalem, and he's watching all this in the temple itself. And sound familiar? Yeah, same thing, right? Same thing? Okay, good. Keep, continue, would you please? When the Lord commanded the man and women, take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim, the man went in. Each of the cherubim had four faces. One was that of the cherub, the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of the eagle. Then the cherubim rose upward. These were the living creatures I had seen on the Bar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them. And when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their side. And the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. And when the cherubim rose, they rose with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. 
Then the Lord of the then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as they went, the wheel went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. These were the living creatures I had seen to meet the God of Israel by the Kabar River, and I realized they were cherubim. Each had four faces and four wings, and under their wings was what looked like a hand's wing. Their faces had the same appearance as those I had seen on the Kabar River. Each one went straight ahead. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so here we've got the same vision, all right, or the, or the, the same image, let me say it that way, the same thing that he sees. He sees it in Babylon. Now he sees it in Jerusalem. And of course, the temple is going to be destroyed and all that stuff a little bit later on. I wanted to see both of those because how important is it if, if he writes it twice? Pretty important, all right, so uh, pretty much the same way. All right, come back to Ezekiel chapter 1 then, and let's start unpacking Ezekiel 1, just kind of now that we have this kind of image in our minds. In the 30th year, a priest was ordained typically at the age of 30. What's interesting, one of the church fathers says, nobody younger than 30 years old should read Ezekiel. I always kind of laugh a little bit about that, all right? You know, you need some maturity, uh, some understanding and so on before you read Ezekiel. But all right, so this is probably in my 30th year, Ezekiel is saying there. But again, how wonderful Ezekiel gives us the timetable of this Babylonian captivity and all that kind of a thing. But as he says there, all right, so at that time and so on, the heavens were opened. Now, that's a pretty significant phrase. The heavens were opened. Have you got your Bibles? Isaiah 6. Somebody read to us Isaiah 6, 1 to 4. Isaiah is prior to this. Isaiah is writing prior to the Assyrian captivity. All right. And so Isaiah has been writing to these people. And these people should have known Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 4. Somebody read that for us, would you? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the two seraphim, each had six wings, two with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he feet. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook. At the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Great. All right. So this was Isaiah's commission. All right. That would have happened earlier. And so God opened up heaven and showed it to him. There were seraphim, not cherubim. All right. Seraphim flaming ones. All right. That that Isaiah saw there. But he saw the throne. He saw the train of his robe filling the temple. The temple fills with smoke and so on. All right. So the heavens were open. Isaiah. They maybe would have known that. Come to the New Testament with me real quickly. What happened at Jesus' baptism, Matthew 3, verse 16? The heavens were open, and the voice from heaven and the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus at his baptism. What happens in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is being stoned? Johnny. Oh, oh no, okay, you were going to ask a question? How old was Jesus when he was baptized? How old was Jesus? Probably 30 years old. Probably 30. We don't know for sure. Okay. It does. It does. Yes, exactly. A foreshadowing and, and fulfillment and, and all of that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, yeah. So here's Ezekiel, 30 years old, priest and so on. Jesus, prophet, priest, and king, 30 years old. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah. Very, very good. Okay, good. So Jesus, at 30 years old, the heavens are opened and the spirit comes down. All right. Stephen, as he's being stoned, what does he say? I saw the heavens open and I see God sitting on his throne and they're all going, blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. But the heavens were open. That's right. In Acts chapter 10, Peter, he has a vision before Cornelius. God comes to him, and what does he see as the heavens are open? The sheet that comes down, right? 
this sheet from heaven that comes down and it's got all these crazy animals in it and so on and rise and eat and don't say what uh, I say is is uh, clean as unclean. Remember all that stuff? All right. So Peter has had the heavens open. And of course, in Revelation chapter four, you know, that's John. All right. Who's going to have that. So just to kind of clue you in, even as it starts off here, you know, something big is going to happen because the heavens were open. All right. As we go on then. So the heavens are open. And so, you know, what is it that he sees? He sees stuff that is so wondrous to him that, you know, he can't hardly believe it. So let me just put this whole thing. This is from Crossways. And um, I appreciate the art artist for doing this. He's looking at this, this image and just can't hardly believe what this image is. And it's strange because it's not like anything that is in this world, but it's the likeness. Again, how important that that is. The likeness. And that's going to be important as we go. So look on your sheets, if you would. And so on uh, the, kind of that next page, page seven and so on, you've got a fiery storm cloud coming from the north out of the, which emerged four unearthly creatures propelling full, by propelling a four-wheeled chariot bearing a celestial platform on which was enthroned the glory of the Lord framed by the bright colors of a rainbow. Very nicely kind of um, tied in with all of this here as we do that. All right. So um, we'll keep going then with searching the scriptures. So Ezekiel sees this and he can't hardly believe it. His hands are there in front of him. And, you know, what he sees is this, this kind of a strange creature that has four faces. We'll look in Revelation in just a little bit and see that there are four living beings in Revelation with the four faces that Ezekiel saw here. We'll see that in just a little bit. And then we see these wheels and, and uh, the, the, the platform uh, and so on that's there. So let's um, take a look at this. So first of all, from the north, let me come back to, to your sheet. Verse four, the north. The Babylonians thought of the north as the primordial home of the gods. <laughs> Kind of sounds like that, right? You know, all the gods and the pantheon and whatever up from the north. How did the Hebrew people view it differently based on the words of? So look at Jeremiah, would you? Again, a contemporary, all right, a little earlier here. But what has Jeremiah told about the north? From Jeremiah 1, verse 4, and Jeremiah 4, verse 6. First of all, 114, sorry, 114. What does it say? Jeremiah 1, 14. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. Disaster is going to come from the north. He's going to say the same thing. Yeah, 4, 6. 4, 6. Yeah. Raise up the signal and go to Zion. Flee for safety without delay. Great. So there's two things as we have this. This vision is coming from the north. All right. So it's God. I know idolatry of the Babylonians and whatever, but all right, kind of keep that in mind. All right. So it's God who's coming there. And what's he bringing? Disaster. All right. So those two things that are there. Okay. Go to the next one where it talks about then a storm cloud, a stormy wind and a cloud. Again, in verse four. All right. He looks a stormy wind came from the north. So what's this? A, the captives heard the Babylonians praise their chief god, Marduk. Yeah, we'll hear more about Marduk as we go along. So he's supposedly the lord of the storm. What does Nahum how fascinating. One of the minor prophets. What does Nahum 1.3 say about the storm and a stormy cloud? Anybody? Nahum? Yeah, they didn't want to do it last night either. It's one of the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament. Nahum 1.3. Christopher, you got it? Would you? They is in the world. 
The ways are in the storm cloud. God's ways are in the storm cloud. And so when they see a storm coming, what could they think about? The Lord's ways are coming. Now, you're kind of frightened, but then with this Nahum passage, it's that comfort, okay, God's going to do something, and his ways are in the storm cloud. So we've got this. What do Ezekiel and Nahum reveal about this stormy wind? It's going to be good for God's people. It's not going to be good for the others, but it's going to be good for God's people because what is he doing in the storm cloud? He's revealing himself to his people. Follow me so far? So we got these kind of dual things going on. From the north, the Babylonians are all going, oh, that's where the gods are. Well, okay, but God is bringing destruction upon the enemies from the north. Good. And now this storm cloud, oh no, the storm cloud, but it's God's ways that are in the storm cloud. So far, so good. Fire. Would the god Marduk enable the Babylonians to burn Jerusalem and the temple? Of course not. Who's going to allow the temple to be burned? God is, of course. It's not the Marduk or the, the idolatry and so on. And so what do we have in Deuteronomy 4? What does God reveal to us as he's talking to Moses and to us? What's he revealing to us? Deuteronomy 4.24 and then Isaiah 10.17. What does God call himself? For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Good. So the fire is the image of the jealous God, the consuming fire. Is jealousy good or bad? <laughs> yes. All right. You know me better. All right. Yeah. Very good. Jealousy is good. God is a jealous God means what? He demands our allegiance, our faithfulness, and so on, right? Danny, what'd you say? Same. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah. So he's a jealous God. His love is overpowering, and he will not share that with anyone else. That's a good thing, all right? So this overpowering fire, God is an overpowering fire, could be to destroy us, but the other thing is, what does fire do? purifies exactly sure and so he's going to come in and he's going to burn up the chaff and and you know the the pure gold and silver and all that's all right you got it so we've got the north we've got the wind and the and the storm and we've got the fire could be bad but we've got all of this image of good how about that other passage from isaiah chapter 10 isaiah 10 17 the light of Israel will become a fire and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. This is Isaiah speaking about the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are the thorns and the briars that are, that are being tough there, all right? So what's God going to do? He's the light that's going to come and burn up, devour the thorns and the thistles and the Assyrians. Are you, are you with me here on this? So... These images that he sees here have meanings, and they have meanings from what God has revealed in, in, in prior times. So that's why it's so important to know these, these other prior times. Good. All right. So we got fire. Let's get the throne. All right. Verse 26, Marduk occupied the throne of the Babylonian pantheon. What would the exiles have remembered from Isaiah 6? We just read that. That was Isaiah's call. Who's on the throne? I saw the Lord, all right, that um, I am who I am, that Yahweh, all right, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, Isaiah chapter 6. And 1 Kings chapter 22, Micaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. We've got these different ones that are that are seeing the throne. So there's a throne. Who's sitting on it? Not Marduk the Lord. Okay. So we got all these, these different images that are there. All right. So let's get a wheel. The statue of Marduk was paraded through the streets of Babylon in ornate vehicles. The celestial chariot at the Lord's command had four bisecting wheels and was therefore ready to proceed in all directions without turning. 
How might these words of Ezekiel have reminded Israel of what happened in 2 Kings chapter 11? I just tell you, his name is Elijah. What happened to Elijah? The fiery chariot came down out of heaven and took him up to heaven. We have already heard about a fiery chariot already. All right. And so we've got that from 2 Kings. And then Habakkuk 3. Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? <laughs> All right. So again, this imagery of this, this wheels, this kind of strange kind of wheels that are intersecting. I don't quite understand. And the wheels, you know, they, they didn't roll, but they moved wherever the spirit had them go. And how fast were they moving? Did you catch that early? Like lightning. Yeah, like flashes back and forth. and back. All right, so good. All right, very mobile, which is kind of interesting. Was he just stuck in Jerusalem? <laughs> all right, yeah, very mobile, all right? And so he can go wherever it is. You get it so far with the imagery that we have here? All right, let's get the living creatures. The exiles heard the Babylonians assign magical powers to grotesque beings depicted and sculptured with combined human and animal features. Israel was to be reminded that the creator had agents at his disposal who represented different kinds of earthly beings animated by the breath of life. In chapter 10, verse 1, which we did read, in 10.1, Ezekiel called them cherubim. In what place known to all the Israelites were two golden cherubim found. Ark of the Covenant, above the Ark of the Covenant. Good. Because of this, how was the Lord often described? The one who sits on the mercy seat among the cherubim. All right? And so the children of Israel would have thought, all right, here's cherubim. Oh, cherubim, that's where God is. And so to have these four cherubim, all right, these, these creatures that are there are cherubim. So what do you expect to be there? God to be with them. All right, you following that? So we've got all of this kind of a thing that's there. Um, Isaiah, uh, Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. You can look at that. All right, so for right now, we've got these kind of strange creatures, and they have four faces. Each of them has four faces. Now, it doesn't tell us in the scriptures, but we have kind of some understanding and some meanings of maybe why they have the four faces. And so as we have it up here, man, the face of a man, well, the crown of creation, all right? So of course, the face of a man, the crown of creation, the lion was the strongest of the wild beasts. The ox was the strongest or most powerful of the domestic animals, and the eagle was the mightiest of the birds. You understand what he's doing? He's picking up these, these key kinds of creation things, and so here we have these powerful creatures that were from the creation that um, we have these, these images of. Now, that's not what the Bible says, but that's kind of how we're looking at this and, and understanding it. Now, they appear again. Yeah, Barb? Yeah, yes. There isn't. What's it called instead? A cherub. a cherub. All right. And a cherub and an ox, we think maybe were somewhat that the cherubs, I know we think of the fat little babies that are naked and whatever that are cherubs. All right. Thank you, Michelangelo. But uh, the cherubs very possibly were, you know, how the bales were the oxes and so on that were there. So very possibly. All right. That, that that's what it was, all right? Don't think of the fat little baby cherubs, okay? But yeah, all right, good, good. I wondered if somebody was gonna catch that or not. Very good. Revelation, look at Revelation, would you? Real quickly, Revelation 4, verse 7. What does John see many centuries later as he has heaven opened? And we have then Revelation chapter 4, 6 to 8. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like upon crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes, four of eyes. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a cat, 
And the third beast had a face in the middle. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes to them, and were led not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Good. All right. And we can keep on going there and so on. All right. So in Revelation, there's four living creatures. Each one of them had their own separate face. All right. It's okay. In Ezekiel, we have all of them have the same four faces. Ah, that's just the way it is. All right. But here we have it. Now, what's interesting is what the medieval, all right, Martin Luther's time before Martin Luther's time and so on, they decided what they would do is that they would give specific gospels these images. And so what they talk about is Matthew is the face of the man. Mark is the face of the lion. Luke is the face of the bull. And John is the face of the eagle. And they have different meanings of this and so on, which is kind of interesting. But, you know, how interesting that in medieval times and so on, as they're thinking about this, here's God's messengers, all right, the one who come and, and speak to them. And so we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as thinking that these are these um, different different images. All right, let me keep going. We got, what, six minutes, goodness sakes. All right, so we've got these, these images, and the images are there to show the glory of the Lord. From Exodus 33, you remember? Um, Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, you cannot see my face. No one can see my face and live, but you can see my passing glory. And so the glory of the Lord is revealed and the glory is able to be seen. We've got three examples also in the Old Testament of people who said that they saw the face of God and they actually saw um, God's glory that's there. First of all, Hagar, Jacob as he's wrestling, and then we have this um, uh, Aaron and Moses as they go up and they see God. All right, just again, a, a fascinating kind of a thing that's that's being talked about with that. But let me come back here to the glory of God. So the glory of the Lord. What do we have? In Exodus chapter 24, in Exodus chapter 24, we have Mount Sinai. What happens on top of Mount Sinai when Moses is to go up? What's going on up there? Oh, well, he'll give them the Ten Commandments, but what, what do they see? They see a cloud. Well, the burning bush is earlier. All right. Yeah, very good. But um, Mount Sinai, yeah, earlier it was burning bush. Yeah, very good. Moses just by himself. This time, it's the storm. It's lightning. It's thunder. It's earthquake. It's the storm that's up there. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the, remember, <laughs> on Sinai? So here's the glory of the Lord. Hopefully, what are they thinking when they hear the glory of the Lord? Mount Sinai, I hope. The Exodus, Mount Sinai, that's there. In Exodus chapter 40, we have the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 40, what happens when the tabernacle is, um, is, is, is begun? What does God do in the tabernacle? His Shekinah glory. Do you know that word, Shekinah glory? Yes, that's an important one to know, all right? As God reveals his glory, the Bible talks about, and it's not necessarily, you won't read it in the Bible, but it's um, the translation, Shekinah glory, that they couldn't go into the tabernacle because God's glory was in the tabernacle. Then in Numbers chapter 16, we have Korah, Datham, and Abiram, you remember, who were, were going against uh, Moses and Aaron. Oh, you know, he didn't just send Moses and Aaron, he sent us too. And you remember what happened to three of them? The glory of the Lord came down and says, separate from them. And the earth opens up and swallows all of them and so on. The glory of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord would come at the tent of meeting and they would know that God would be coming to them. The glory of the Lord, not only a tabernacle, but first Kings chapter eight is the temple. All right. So again, the purpose that I want to talk to you about here is the glory of the Lord was a very familiar term to them, or should have been, 
that this is God himself coming to them. So here, this vision, this image, this, this strange thing that Ezekiel is seeing is the glory of the Lord. It's God himself who is coming and speaking to him, which is going to be important as we have it here. So Ezekiel, just a quick look, look through Ezekiel here. So we've got the form of a man. The glory of the Lord is a form of a man. In chapter 10 that we read, all right, chapter 8, 9, and 10, the glory of the Lord is there and it forsakes the temple. It's going to return in chapter 43. Woohoo! It's going to be a while, but that's the big, the big switch in Ezekiel 43. Like those three times in Ezekiel, we have three of them in Revelation. Revelation 1, where the um, Jesus shows himself the glory to John. In chapters 4 and 5, we'll look at this when we look at, especially Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10, this heavenly throne that Ezekiel saw, John sees, and then this whole replacement of the temple. Don't worry, I'll tell you this again later on, but just kind of a, a, big, a big look at it as we begin with it. Finally, and I did want to stop, I uh, did want to get to this. Finally, who is the glory of the Lord? You knew it, didn't you? The answer is always Jesus. And so the glory of the Lord is Jesus. What does John tell us? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen, wow. So the glory of the Lord that we see in Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord that will be continually spoken about in Ezekiel, who do you think of? Jesus, as we go through, and it's it's not going to be quite so difficult as we're thinking that this is all about Jesus. And the glory is hidden because the glory is in the baby Jesus. The glory is in the crucified Jesus. The glory is in, of course, the crucified, resurrected, ascended Jesus and so on that is there. And so Ezekiel. The glory of the Lord that's revealed to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's message is to a stubborn people. Not like people today. Oh, wait a minute. No, it is just like people today. That message that is coming to very stubborn people. Okay? So we're going to see some bizarre stuff um, that he's going to be talking about here as well um, with the rest of Ezekiel. Okay? That's the start. And, and we'll continue on. So chapters two and three next time, if you get a chance, read through about as much of Ezekiel as you can. It's, it's a little long, all right? But, you know, read through about as much as you can. If you can get to like uh, at least halfway through about chapter 15 or 16 or something, you know, you, you'll, you'll kind of get a feel for Ezekiel a little bit better because it is pretty strange. All right, let's pray. Praise and thanks, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us as we read and study your word. Continue to be with us and bless us as, as we uh, read and hear and learn from Ezekiel. Help us to hear that message that you gave to him, and then help us, as we heard in the gospel reading today, to point people to Jesus, to, to point people to you, our Lord and Savior. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Pastor, I have a question for you. Where we stop the video, but I haven't stopped.